Father in heaven, I'm asking that you will bless us as we study today. That you would teach us what is right. I ask for your spirit to do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I was in Malaysia on my mountain when I was actually in a meeting, but I wasn't listening to the meeting as well as I should have been because directly behind the speaker in the jungle was a troop of monkeys that were in a very large tree. And uh, that tree, well, it was, I can't really show you, but maybe if I back up, you can get an idea. But it was uh, three quarters or maybe 80% of a meter in diameter. And it had no branches in the lower 15 meters of the tree. Those branches had long since fallen off. So the monkeys had gotten into the tree from another tree that was nearby. And because uh, monkeys, you know, they don't have claws like squirrels do. A, a squirrel could climb right up the bark of a tree, but a monkey uses branches in his hands and that's how he climbs. So I was watching these monkeys and uh, I saw one monkey do something so interesting. He came to the one of the lower branches on the tree and he looked down and about three meters or four below him was a branch full of unused, uneaten leaves, just what monkeys like. You know, those new tender leaves, that the shoots, just like when you're eating vegetables, many times the, the fresh and small ones are more tender, more edible. Monkeys feel the same way about leaves. And here was an entire branch and no one else was on it. So that monkey, he uh, dropped himself down that three or four meters onto that branch. And immediately I knew he was in trouble. He didn't know it. But I'll tell you what I saw. I saw that there was no way for him to get off the branch because monkeys can't climb up that four meters of, of trunk. And it's, it's so far down to the granite rocks below and there's no other tree nearby to jump to. Uh, and so that monkey was really stuck, but you know, he didn't see it. So he enjoyed himself. He ate the leaves and this leaf and that leaf. And maybe for 15 minutes, he was just enjoying himself. And then he was ready to join the troop. And I watched him walk from one end of the branch back to the trunk of the tree, back to the end of the branch, back to the trunk of the tree. And now he knew what I had known. He knew he was stuck. He couldn't go up. He couldn't go down. There was no way for him to get off the branch. Well, eventually he did what you might have done in the same situation. He decided to try to shimmy on the tree, you know, put his arms around it and hold it tight. But he was smaller than a human and his arms didn't fit around very well. And he only made it to about, well, you can't see, but uh, about this far down the tree before he fell to the rocks below. The Solomon, the wise man Solomon said that the wise man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the fool passes on and is punished. What, what was Solomon saying? He was saying, use your foresight. Don't just think about today, think about tomorrow. When you think about going in debt, don't think about today, only think about tomorrow. When you think about marriage, don't think about today only, think about tomorrow. But when you're offended at church by the actions of someone, don't just think about today, think about tomorrow, about your eternal well-being, about heaven, about the salvation of your family members. Many times, thank you, on right on here. Who we're going to hang out with, what we're going to look at, what we're going to listen to, what we're going to eat, how much we're going to eat. We just think about, we just think about our personal indulgence. And uh, when you're thinking about yourself only and not thinking about tomorrow or next year or 10 years, we can end up stuck like that monkey. 
Uh, I'll come back to that monkey about foresight later in our study. But I want to tell you also another story about Musab. Musab uh, grew up in Yemen, and while he was there, a war started to get away from the war zone. He came to study in Malaysia. He was studying uh, engineering, but it was particularly uh, computer engineering and uh, engineering of small electronics. And uh, while he was studying there, I began to give Bible studies to one of his friends, also from Yemen. Well, that friend didn't take studies for more than six or seven months before he turned away. But by that time, I had made contact with Musab. And Musab studied the prophecies of Daniel. I've written studies, especially for uh, Muslims, and he was considering those. And um, as he studied and learned, his natural skepticism against Islam blossomed. And he began to accept the truth for this time. Well, let me just speed the process up and tell you that it's been now two years, and Musab is a thoroughgoing Seventh-day Adventist today, helping to reach out to other people like himself, doing what he can to share light. Already, some of his childhood friends from Ib, a city far south of Sana in Yemen, have accepted Jesus. And even now, he's putting his energy and his skills into uh, making videos that will be helpful in reaching people that know Arabic with those same studies that helped him. He, he was very uh, gifted in English. So you can pray for Musab. But I want you to learn something from him. That his friend that I studied with earlier, that friend ended up becoming a dead end. That friendship didn't go anywhere. And when you're sharing today with your friends, and there where you are, I think that you have friends, both many that are Hindu and a lesser number who are Muslim. When you're sharing with them, maybe the person that you target may end up disappointing you. Don't let disappointment take over your life. Remember that even the friends and the family of the person who didn't uh, value the truth more than life, maybe those friends will. I remember Musab when he gave his life to Jesus, of course, that puts him in danger. And he told me that there were ways that he could maybe escape to a Western country, but he didn't take those. He said, I did not accept Jesus for the sake of safety. So he's living even today in a Muslim country. And if you want that kind of strength of character and foresight in your converts, Remember, it might not be from the first person that you reach, maybe a friend of that person or a friend of a friend. The truth is that it was several steps before I got to Musab. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're not quite ready for the new study today. I want to do a review of yesterday. You remember yesterday I showed you uh, this little picture. I hope you can see that about the higher powers and the lower powers that we talked about how those lower powers were so much stronger after thousands of years of indulgence, how the higher powers were weaker after being ignored for so long. And we talked about how when, when God sends his Holy Spirit to strengthen us, those upper powers are strengthened by the Spirit. We read that in Ephesians 3, and how that sets us free from the law of sin and death. I hope you remember those things. But someone might ask, what about Jesus when he was here on earth? What was his mind like? Well, I'll tell you the ways it was similar to yours and the ways it was different. First of all, it was just like yours in that he inherited 4,000 years of self-indulgence. So his lower powers were large and well-developed. He had strong passions, strong hungers, strong desires. But Jesus was born, born again. That is, he was strengthened by the Spirit, even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist was born that way too. And if you are a parent today and you're thinking of becoming pregnant again, or if for your first time you're thinking about it, if you and your spouse will be filled with the Spirit the way that Elizabeth was and the way that Zechariah was, if both parents are filled with the Spirit, 
then they can pass on to their child to be born filled with the Spirit the way John the Baptist was. Well, Jesus was born filled with the Spirit. So that was different than you and I were born. But there's something else even more significant. Before you were old enough to make moral decisions, you would form some bad habits. You can form bad habits at the age of one, at the age of two. You can form bored, bad habits very young. Before the age of three, you form many bad habits. And you inherit weaknesses from your parents that if you indulge those weaknesses, very quickly turn into habits. Let me try to illustrate that. A man might have an alcoholic father, and if he never tastes alcohol, he'll never really feel that weakness. But if he tastes that alcohol one time, that weakness from his dad combined with quickly a binding habit. Habit is an entity we didn't talk about yesterday. So you have those I, I have an internet connection here that isn't always stable, and that's why I pause there for a minute so you wouldn't miss anything. But we have those higher powers that are weakened, but when we strengthen them by the Spirit, when we have those lower powers, yet there is a third entity. It's outside of our mind. Habits aren't something that God has given us. Adam and Eve weren't created with habits. You weren't born with habits. Uh, habits that are well ingrained are called propensities. And when you, when you were young, you began to make habits. Maybe you said no when your mom said come. Maybe you were uh, willful and uh, maybe you threw temper tantrums. Those kind of habits, when you became 11 or 12 and began to think for yourself in a moral way, those habits were pushing you in the direction that you were already going. Habits are like inertia. Whatever direction you're going, they push you in that direction. So you at age 12 had thousands of years of indulgence behind you, making your desire strong. And you had already a decade of habit pushing you in bad directions and it was those habits combined with those desires that felt to you like evil desires. The desire for nutrition combined with the habit of gluttony feels like a strong desire to eat more food when your stomach has already filled or has enough food. That desire for love combined with a habit of using pornography feels like an overwhelming desire for pornography. Habit is that entity. And I don't describe habit in that first meeting. I didn't because habit isn't part of your mind in terms of hardware. Habit is more like software and it can change. And as you are set free by the will of God and begin to make moral decisions going in the right direction, you begin to form new habits. And that same habit that was pushing you the wrong way at age 10 can be pulling you the right way at age 30. You can have an experience where your habits cease to be elements aiding Satan, and then instead it becomes natural for you to do the right, the right thing or to go the right way. So did Jesus have an advantage over us? Oh, it's a tricky question. The answer is Jesus had an incredible advantage over unconverted persons. He had an incredible advantage over unconverted persons because he was born again. And Jesus had an incredible advantage over persons who begin to sin in their childhood, begin to indulge themselves and to, to live in a selfish way. Jesus didn't have any bad habits from his childhood. But you know, Jesus had no advantage over you that you can't have yourself by the power of the gospel. Jesus doesn't ask you to have lived your entire life without sinning. He's not asking you to have been born sinless and to live your entire life sinless. He's asking you to come by his power to where he is. And today we're going to study something about how that happens. 
how you can form new habits, how you by habit can lessen the power of those lower uh, appetites, how you can strengthen the power and develop the power of your higher powers, your mind and reason and conscience, how you can be filled with the spirit continually, how your habit can push in the right direction, you can come to the point where Jesus had no advantage over you. In fact, where he's brought you up by his own advantage to, for you to have the same experience. You have a Bible with you, I think. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. And you're going to be looking right now at verse, we're going to start in verse 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in or by the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. That is, if the amount of grace and peace in your life is similar today to what it was three years ago, that's not the ideal Christian experience. Ideally, you should have more peace today than you had heretofore. It, the grace operating in your life should be greater now than it was in the past. And how does that happen in verse 2? It says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Well, that's what we're going to study today, about how the mind works to utilize knowledge for the purpose of sanctifying your character. Look at verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What has God given us? Everything we need. Everything we need to live forever, that's life. And to have a change in character, that's godliness. How did he do it? It says, through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. Something about knowing Jesus, it gives us everything we need. Maybe that reminds you of what Jesus said in John 17, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you have sent. It's the same idea that Peter expresses here. Now look at verse 4. We're going to launch from verse 4. By which we have been given, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I read this morning about Ravi Zacharias, a very significant and important man from India, an apologist for the Christian community. But what I read this morning was about a sexual addiction that he had that caused him to behave in an unchristian manner towards ladies that he was working with in a spa that he partly owned near Atlanta. I was saddened to read it. And I think about Zachar about Ravi, about how he didn't have what you have as Seventh day Adventist. He didn't have what you know about overcoming the power of those lower powers, about having the force of God's spirit operating in your life to overcome. Let's read verse four again, and I think you'll see something. By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having, listen, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through desire. Why is the world getting worse and worse? Why is the world on a downhill experience? That's because of desire. It's because of this idea of just do it, of you deserve it. Indulge yourself. You might see this in advertising campaigns. Uh, desires when they take the lead, those desires degrade us. There are things we do and things we listen to, things we see and things we eat that reduce our moral capacity. And that's called corruption. But do you see in verse four that we can escape corruption? How do we escape it? Well, it says that's by having the living power of God inside of us. When we talk about God living in us, or Jesus being in our heart, like we've seen as children, we're really talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the representative of God. And as an aside, uh, the Holy Spirit represents Jesus so thoroughly 
that you might even say in some context that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. That is, when we're talking about Jesus in the heart, that is the Holy Spirit. But comments that have been made like that in some of Ellen White's letters have led some people down a road that I call anti-Trinitarianism. And if you know someone who is moving in that direction, I wish you would visit my site, BibleDoc, BibleDoc.org, and look at that article called The Godhead for Seventh-day Adventists. I think you'd find material there that would be of interest to you, but it's not really germane to our topic today. I mean, it's not really the topic we have today. So I'm going to get back to that topic. We want the Spirit to be living in our heart. And when the Spirit lives inside of us, when by faith we live with the Spirit, we escape the corruption. The, the alcoholic escapes his alcohol. The tobacco addict escapes his cigarettes. The porn addict becomes pure. Why? This is how it happens. It's by escaping by God's power. But do you see how we escape here in verse 4? It says, by exceeding great and precious promises. Do you have, do you use those exceeding great and precious promises? I have at times in mission work encountered one of my students being discouraged. Someone who has been trying to do God's work but then I find them in the depths of discouragement. And you know, sometimes when that happens, I ask them, what promises are you claiming? And often I find the answer is, I'm not thinking of any promises. I haven't been thinking of promises. And then I'll share with them that promises are to us what steps are on a ladder, what the rungs are on a ladder. The promises are what give us stability. The promises are like the guardrail on a, on a walkway that is near a, a steep ledge. You want that rail there. They give us stability. And are there any promises? Maybe I'll, sometimes for Vespers programs in the States or in Malaysia, I will sit in a group and I'll just ask people, what are promises you can think of that are encouraging? And I love to hear people expressing their favorite. Mine is 2 Corinthians 12.9. Where, where Paul hears from God the idea that my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul responds, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So what I'm saying to you is that by the knowledge of God, somehow we can partake of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world. But now here's the truth. And I want you to think about this truth because it's relevant to you. There are people who have known about Jesus for 30 years who haven't been sanctified at all. Isn't it true? Aren't there people who have known about Jesus for decades, even talked about him, whose lives are not really different today than they were? What makes the difference? If you have your Bibles, we've already looked at the answer, but we're going to look at it even more. Turn with me to the book of Jude. Jude, and we're going to look at verse 5. Jude, in verse 5, it says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having escaped the that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them who did not believe. Think about that verse for a minute. Here are people that were led out of Egypt let out of slavery. They watched Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. They experienced manna in the wilderness. Well, in this verse, they haven't quite experienced that yet when they were saved out of Egypt. And what happened to them in the wilderness? You know, those same people that experienced miracles were destroyed in the wilderness. The same ones. That thought ought to make us sober shouldn't it shouldn't it give us some some reason to pause or to consider and you notice how the verse starts it says i'm going to tell you this though you've known it in the past i think even you as bible students in the past yesterday if i'd asked you what happened to those that were led out of egypt and you had thought it through you would have remembered oh in 40 years 
They all died in the wilderness, all the ones over the age of 20. You knew it, but today is the day when you're thinking about it. Turn back a few pages to where we just were. Second Peter chapter 1. We read verses 2 to 4. Yesterday, we talked about Peter's ladder in verses 3 to 11. But now we're going to look down at verse 12. Second Peter chapter 1 and looking at verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them. Do you see that? Do you see it? Though you know them? And you might say, Peter, why are you going to tell me about this when I already know it? Is it because I'm kind of shaky? Maybe I'm going to forget it. But notice what he says, though you know them and be established in the present truth. So here's Peter, and he's coming to people who already know the truth. They've heard it over and over. They're settled in it. They know it. And he says, I would be negligent if I don't tell you again. Do you see what he's aiming for? Look at verse 13. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent or this body, to stir you up by reminding you. What's he saying? He's saying the truth only affects you when you think about it. So though you know Jesus comes soon, though you are settled in the fact that he comes soon, it's when you're thinking about his soon coming that it affects your choices at the table, in the home, when you're talking to your spouse or to your children. It's when you're thinking about the truth that the truth really affects you. Now that, now think about that. But let's look at it somewhere else. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and looking at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you have received. Now, what do you think? Did Paul share the gospel with them earlier? Well, of course he did. He visited Corinth and raised up the church. He shared the gospel with them. And did they accept it? Well, of course they did, or they wouldn't be part of the church. So he says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you in the past, which you've received, and wherein you stand. Now, Paul, why are you going to tell the Corinthians this gospel? They've already heard it. They already accepted it. They're standing firm in it. Look at verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast, or if you keep in mind, it says in the King James Version. And I, Actually, I think that it says the same thing, but it means if you keep in mind. If you hold fast... Otherwise, have believed in vain. What Paul is the saying is that the gospel will save you, but not by magic. He says the gospel can save you, but not by, by just a surface knowledge of it. It's not the fact that you know that Jesus paid for your sin. It's when you think about his death for your sin. It's when you consider what it means that he carried the weight of your sins. It's when I think about these things. I think it's one reason God invited me to be a speaker. Because he knew that I inherited significant weaknesses. And it's as I consider these things and I consider about Jesus We seem to have lost the speaker's connection. Please bear with us as he joins us back. All right, can you hear me again? I think you can. 
Uh, this is one of the results or one of the effects of living in a rural part of the desert where Dr. Nudley lives. So you just can't expect such consistent um, data. Let me come right back to that thought. Why is it that the truth doesn't sanctify many people? It's because they aren't considering it. And this is the same reason why God has not committed the gospel to the hand of angels. You know, angels could appear right there in Bangalore. They could appear just like humans. They could go door to door sharing the truth. But you know what? Angels don't need to do that for their own salvation's sake. And if they did it perfectly, you would never even try. It'd be so discouraging for you. You'd compare yourself to that mighty angel and how he gives perfect studies. But you and I, we need to share. It's critical to us that we find an opportunity to be in the field talking to non-Adventist. I make it a point of my life to always every day be talking to people who don't know the truth. I have to do it. I'm not always around them, so I do it mostly by WhatsApp and by messaging. It's by sharing but with people who don't know that the truth is put in front of our own faces. Parents, it's by sharing the gospel with your children that you end up thinking about the gospel. It's by encouraging your children not to indulge their passions that you begin to see your own passions in the right light. That is, as you tell them about the little boy that shared his fish and his loaves of bread with the 5,000, you begin to wonder why you hold so tightly to your loaves and fishes. I'm trying to share with you that the truth has power indeed. Adventism has an advantage over the Pentecostal religion or the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Catholic church. No, it's not that those brethren are more, less spiritual than you. It's not that they are less close to God than you. The fact is they have less truth than you. And the truth has the power to change us. It really motivates and moves us. But the, but the truth is a power that makes its entire appeal, not to your passions, but to your reason, your conscience, your judgment. That is the truth turns your reason, your conscience, your judgment almost into a type of spiritual desire. The truth turns your inner man into a motive force so that when you consider it, it becomes a counterbalance to the passions that are pushing you the wrong way. This might be a large idea for you to think through. Maybe you're not going to get it instantly. You might want to review your notes for a while. But I want to talk to you about two more ideas before we close. One of them you're going to find in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you're in 15 now, it's only back a little bit. Oh, no, that was 1 Corinthians 15, so it's forward a bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 4. It says here, I should wait a minute for you, shouldn't I? 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. When I read those strongholds, I think of addictions. I think of well-entrenched habits. Someone asked yesterday about anger. Anger can be... For... That's what the weapons of our spiritual life are for, for pulling down strongholds. Look at verse 5, casting down imaginations. So it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, uh, some translations, like the one I'm reading here, actually says arguments. But I want to say imagination is the right word. It's better than the word argument for that verse. What we're talking about is the way God created the mind. He gave you a gift of imagination. That imagination, <clears throat> it's a gift similar to your eyes. Your eyes allow you to see what's near you. And by Zoom, you can see even what's far from you. You can see me here in New Mexico. But with your imagination, 
you can see things that you can't even see with your computer. You can see your childhood and imagine what happened there. You can look with foresight into the future and imagine what's going to be the effect of, of this decision. You could imagine Jesus coming back or you could imagine Jesus dying. It's your imagination that allows a mechanic, when he listens to the sound of your engine, to visualize what's going on with the pistons, why it's making that sound, and, and to understand that probably the oil is not getting there properly. The imagination was given to allow truth to have a more emotional impact on you. Your imagination allows truth that is distant from you, distant by space or by time, to have an emotional impact that measures with the reality. Let me try to say that in simpler words. Jesus carrying my sins and dying for me, if I had seen it in person, would have made me cry. But it happened 2,000 years ago far away. And now when I hear about it with my ears, it doesn't do much for me emotionally. So God gave us an imagination that allows us to get the benefit that we miss. But let me try to say it another way. This is why you can be a child of Abraham. Because just as your children watch you, and by observing you, they end up learning many of your behaviors. In the same way, by watching Father Abraham in the scripture and seeing how he carries Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, you can learn that behavior. You can inherit from the patriarchs in the Bible by considering them. This is why the Bible says that the truth is, uh, or that the second commandment says that uh, God's wrath is on the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him, but he shows mercy to thousands of generations of those that love him. Well, we haven't even had a thousand generations since Adam. But what does that mean? It means that the power of the gospel is greater than the power of genetics. And it's by considering the heroes of faith and our Savior himself that we can inherit, as it were, from their lives. I've said this a lot of different ways. So what is Satan trying to do? He tries to infect your imagination, to infect your imagination with paranoia, to infect your imagination with grandiose ideas of yourself. He tries to infect your imagination with movies. And in fact, movies grab your imagination and they take it in a way that the media directors wanted it to go. That media is designed to grab your imagination and play with it as it were. And now your imagination is so infected that you could be in church and your mind could be wandering and you could be seeing and imagining things going on outside of uh, reality, even movie scenes, even while you're right there in the word of God is coming to your ears, but not getting very deep into your mind. The imagination is one of those high things that destroys men. And I know that this message will be listened to by those who aren't even here listening at the moment. Uh, there's 30 of you now, but maybe there'll be more later. For, for those who listen now and later, let me refer you to Mind, Character, and Personality, page 595. In that particular uh, page, you're going to find how God utilizes the imagination to help men who, or women who have problem with impurity to develop pure minds. It's possible to develop pure minds. And I'll tell you part of it is by having this divine nature, by escaping that corruption, by letting the truth have that impact on us. It's by knowing Jesus in a way that motivates us. Well, someone might be getting bored. They might be saying, Mr. Prude is saying the same thing over and over and over. It's true. Did you notice what Peter said? I'm not going to be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things. What Paul said, I'm going to, the gospel will work unless it doesn't have your attention. 
what Jude said, though you once knew this. So I'm going to review these thoughts. Before I do, I wrote down some practical applications. I just opened my notes back up and look at them. Oh, yes. It's possible the truth will have little impact on you because of one issue I haven't brought up. And that is, you might have a dull mind. I don't mean a dull mind that you inherited. I mean a dull mind that you cultivated. Do you know that gluttony dulls your mind? Eating too much does it. And uh, this is one of the dangers of white rice, by the way. Uh, white rice, because it doesn't have enough uh, mineral content, you're, it doesn't satiate you soon enough, so you can eat a lot, a lot of it. And that's why diabetes is growing exponentially in India in the last 20 years, because of people having enough wealth to eat a lot more white rice and to eat much larger. But that gluttony dulls your mind and it, it takes away the add off truth. In the same way, eating that flesh meat, that, that flesh meat, eating the fish and the chicken, the fried chicken, the beef, the whatever, that meat dulls the mind. And it makes it harder to appreciate spiritual things. When you end up having that, that diet that, that dulls the mind, when you come to church, you might even need to have very beaty rhythm, rhythmic music just to make you even feel like you've had a spiritual experience. But when your mind is sharp, then the truth itself, even unmixed with music at all, even with a preacher who has no passion in his voice, the truth itself could cut divide the heart. Maybe you've developed in your school life habits of sleep that deprive you. Do you know when you're sleep deprived, your mind is dull? That you would do better going early to bed and early to rise a month before your serious exams? You would do better at your recollection and do better in your scoring than if you'd stay up that entire month cramming to late in the night? But I'm not here to tell you how to do well in your exams. I'm here to tell you how to do well in sanctification. You want to have a clear mind. It's not for nothing that God gave a health message to the Adventist church. It's not for nothing. It's for something. It's why Jesus talked about fasting. It's because we were intended to have our lower powers under the control of our higher powers, to have our appetite under the control of reason. And when we do, it makes all the difference. And then guilt also dulls the mind in a, different way. in a different way. We are holistic individuals. So when you're guilty, when you haven't repented of your sins, when you're still in that addiction, that masturbation habit, for example, really dulls your mind and removes your ability to feel what God wants you to feel. You must attack it regardless. Even if you don't feel the guilt, attack that evil habit so that you can be restored to feeling so that you the leopard can suddenly have flesh that feels one last thought do you remember hebrews 12 1 and 2 verse 2 talks about jesus it says who set before him he endured the thought despising the shame what you're reading there is about the proper use of the imagination. Jesus took his mind, and instead of focusing on the fact that he was in pain and undressed shamefully, he put his mind into the future on the idea that you could be in heaven. It was the joy that was set before him that enabled him. Now look at verse 3. It says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you also be wearied and faint in your mind. What is it saying? It's saying the way you get tired of well-doing is by not considering Jesus. The way that you have energy to keep going spiritually is by a consideration of Jesus. And it's by considering how he endured that unpleasantness 
by using his imagination correctly. It's by using your imagination, but Jesus using his imagination. It's by you considering him that you are nerved, you receive spiritual energy, your upper, your inner man, your upper powers are strengthened to resist, and you go forward braced for another temptation. Well, it's time for me to, to close and to pray with you. And then I'm going to stay here for a few minutes to give you a chance to ask questions. What we're talking about today is about diseases of the imagination where it goes off on its own. Tomorrow we'll even talk about hallucinations and, and worse diseases of the imagination and develop that idea further. But right now, the normal problem of an imagination that goes in the wrong directions and loses its power as a, as a mind strength. Imagination loses its power to help you. But when you bring those thoughts into captivity and choose to put, when you bring those thoughts into captivity and choose to put your mind on the, on the truth, the right wholesome things, you can begin to experience sanctification at a rate that matches the troubleless, the tro troublesome times that we're in. I hope you understand. Let me pray with you. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would sanctify us through the truth that we know, that you would lead us into an experience with the truth that would make a difference for us. I ask for you to fill us with your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen.